Our distinguished guest scholar today is Professor Yunan O'Halpin. He was educated BA and MA level at University College Dublin and received his PhD from Cambridge University in 1982. Currently, he's a member of the Royal Irish Academy and he holds what I find a very impressive title. He is Bank of Ireland Professor of Contemporary Irish History and Director of the Center for Contemporary Irish History at Trinity College and has held this position since 2000. He previously was Professor of Government at Dublin City University. Yunan has supervised five Trinity College Dublin PhDs to completion since 2003. Currently has four other students in tow, and two more are expected in October. His books include The Decline of the Union, British Government in Ireland, 1891 to 1920, published in Dublin, 1987. Head of the Civil Service, The Study of Warren Fisher, published in London, 1989. And his widely acclaimed Oxford University Press book, which was published in 1999, Defending Ireland, the Irish State and its Enemies since 1922. He also published with Michael Kennedy, Ireland and the Council of Europe from Strasbourg as recently as 2000. His edited books include MI5 and Ireland, 1939 to 1945, The Official History, which appeared in Dublin in 2003. And his edited books also include Documents on Irish Foreign Policy, Volumes 1 through 4, Volume 5 being due, or imminently due, and raised in uh, November of this year, entitled Intelligence, Statecraft, and International Power. His books that are presently in preparation are British Intelligence and Ireland in the Second World War, which Oxford expects to publish possibly in 2008, and another book with Dahi O'Karan entitled The Dead of the Irish Revolution, which is under discussion with Yale University Press. Incidentally, his chapters in various books and articles in professional journals number no fewer than four dozen. Well, in addition to these prolific publications, Professor Wilhelton still manages to serve as co-convener in Dublin on the weekly research seminar in contemporary Irish history. Unit is a former student of our current Burns scholar, Professor Tom Garvin, and he's an especially good friend of many of us in Irish studies here at Boston College. His presentation today is entitled, Whose Blood Was on Their Hands and Why? Family Narrative and the Records of the Irish Revolution, 1919 to 1923. Please join me in welcoming Professor O'Hall. <laughs> Right, thanks very much, Tom. It's, it's always good when the audience claps at the beginning because you, know, you can bank it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it really doesn't matter what you say thereafter. This, is, this isn't a terribly structured uh, talk. Um, it's partly a sort of a family travelogue, I'm afraid, but it's also about sources uh, for recent Irish history. And in some ways, the paradox that the further away we get from the events, the more sources in some ways are becoming available. It's also, I hope, uh, uh, I want to get out a message that there's a key source uh, which, which the Irish government hasn't yet released in relation uh, to the Irish Revolution, uh, which I have written about in the papers, is absurd. Uh, that, that, that crucial material, we berate the British for not releasing material, and then they do release material, and the Irish government itself has perhaps 70, 80,000 files with the most detailed accounts you'll get of individuals' experience of the Irish Revolution because they're looking for pensions, uh, and uh, the government still can't bring itself to release it. Um, I'll also be talking a bit about official secrecy, partly because in the last few months I've been on a, a committee established by the Department of Justice to look at their secret files. They have a secret archive, and we've been allowed to see the archive. It goes back to the foundation of the state and up to the present. And um, the interesting thing about the material I've mainly looked at, which is material for what in Ireland is called the emergency, the Second World War, uh, internees material, is, is, it's extremely interesting in the sense why the state is, 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 is careful about releasing it. Because the material isn't. It's not because it's of state secrecy. The big problem with this material, and it's a real problem I've discovered, is personal privacy. Right? And that makes me think. I nag the British government about intelligence records a lot. And they, they release some, they don't release others, and they redact material and so on. But, and they, say, they have often said to me, yeah, but this isn't about secrecy. This is about confidentiality of individuals. And the more, I, when I, having been worked in a secret archive now, I see that that's largely, bizarrely, why, why, why the state finds why, why it difficult to release materials. Not because it will name informers. It's not anything like that. It's because it may mention that some internees have certain medical conditions. Right? 
It's one thing to die or to, you know, to be interned for Ireland in the car for three years. But if when you're eventually released, you're released on medical grounds because you come back from parole with something wrong with you, but the army don't, they know all about it, but they don't want to treat it. You don't, you know, that bit of the file can't really get out. Anyway, so I'll be wandering around these various areas. Uh, I'm also, as I say, doing a kind of sort of a Woody Allen-esque uh, walk through my family uh, because of uh, my family background, my, 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 my grandparents' generation. Uh, all four of my grandparents were involved in one way or another uh, in the, in the uh, fight for independence or whatever you want to call it. And three of my grandparents were very much involved in the Civil War. Um, and yet, because of family histories, and you probably, American families are probably different to Irish families. American families are probably structured, rational, organized, you know, whatever. But Irish families are strange. And I, in, in terms of the narrative of the Irish Revolution, uh, my, my family on my mother's side is particularly strange because I heard all the time about one, one of my, one of my relatives, right? The shadow of a gunman, an 18-year-old gunman, Kevin Barry, dominates our family narrative, right? But my grandmother never spoke about what she did during the War of Independence and the Civil War. She was General Secretary of the Republican Prisoner's Dependence Fund, which is basically a very senior job. She was the personal link between De Valera and Liam Lynch, the military leader on the anti-treaty side. Uh, she did all sorts of stuff till she, till she got married and started having children. She went to America, as I, I show you, as part of the Republican delegation in 22. She went to Australia in 24 and 25, but she didn't want to talk about that. She never wrote it down. It wasn't interesting. All she wanted to talk about was her, the blessed martyr, her brother. Right? She never mentioned her husband's brother, Paddy. Right? Paddy Maloney is another, another of my mother's uncle who was killed. But she didn't mention him, I think, because he wasn't famous. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> right? It's very odd. That, uh, uh, and because of those dominating things on, on my father's side, uh, <coughs> where in some ways the story is in some respects arguably more, more, both more tragic and more uplifting, and that my grandfather had to leave Northern Ireland, make a life in the South and so on. Uh, we never heard about that at all. I found out about him largely through, through Northern Ireland prison records, right? which have belatedly which, which have become available. And then that triggers memories in the family. So it's very strange. It's just strange. I, I'm sure it's the same everywhere. But uh, it, 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 is, it is peculiar uh, in, the Irish con in the Irish context uh, how, how uh, we, uh, on the one hand, assume that states, states uh, keep all the secrets back and that families are the custodians of memory. But in fact, they're, they're custodians of very partial, limited, and uh, distorted memory. And in fact, one of my main arguments would be that as more state records become available, whether it's about prisoners, whether it's about incidents or whatever, the state is very often, certainly in the case of my northern grandfather, it's a much better custodian uh, of, of, in a sense, of, of, his, of, his, of his history than his family have been. Right? Anyway, it's all very strange. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll begin by saying a little bit about my, my, uh, my grandmother, uh, Cathy Barry. And, her, uh, and the picture of her here. Again, I found this by chance. Uh, that's her on the left. She came in, in early 22 with other um, anti-treaty Republicans. She came as the sister of the martyr Kevin Barry, uh, Countess Markovich, uh, Skelly, J.J. Kelly there, and Austin Stack. These photographs were all taken in the States. I found them very recently in, in a cupboard in my aunt's house uh, to, to, look, to, look, uh, to, to raise money for the anti-treaty side. But Everything she did almost was about related to, uh, and everything she did after to this iconic figure, uh, uh, Kevin Barry, whom you may have heard of, a medical student, uh, a lad of 18 summers, they say, uh, who, who was um, executed on the 1st of November 1920 uh, for his involvement in the killing of three soldiers. Uh, he was a lad of 18 summers. One of the lads he killed was 50, Private Washington, 50, right? And, Two of the three soldiers, perhaps all three of them, they weren't even armed, right? And these things never, these things weren't weren't said or not said, but they never ne never obtruded somehow into the uh, the sacred narrative, if you like, right? It's it's amazing. But the other reason that where Kevin Barry is venerated is a perfectly good reason. I mean, I was like Tom, the Jesuit boy, was sort of Bodie Belvedere. I was a Jesuit boy. Now, he was a Jesuit boy. This is a Jesuit college. The Jesuits are connected. And his iconic status partly hinges on, he was a medical student, he was a Jesuit boy, right? He's got to be, you know, 
we middle class have to mobilize. We have to save, save, save ourselves. And so he became, he was very brave under interrogation and so on. There's a fantastic account in the British file of his last hours, which was only released. The file was only opened seven or eight years ago, years ago along with the 1916 files. And the reason the British kept them closed this long, of course, wasn't because it would show discredit the British state, but it was how it's convention that for, for people uh, in these circumstances, you, do, you don't open their papers till their families are long gone, right? So, so it's, not, it's not a secrecy thing as such, it's a confidentiality thing. But there's a fantastic account, a one-page account of, of, of Kevin Barry's last hours. Because the conventional published accounts, there's a certain amount of rosy beads and thing, and you know the song, do you know the song, Tom? Yeah. There's broken heart and mother, who's sad grief, you know, and all that. Uh, well, bursting tears. One, one, of, one of Ken Barry's warders tell, tells a British officer who writes a note of it, is that the, you know, the prisoner Barry spent most of his last hours talking sport, right? Okay, and, he, and it says, I didn't know the convention was available then, or uh, right, so that he, he said, as time went on and there was no talk of a reprieve, he remarked somewhat cynically that ha that only happens in the cinema anyway. You know the thing, waiting for the governor, the governor, the, the, mm -hmm. the thing? And, and finally, the last line is, he went to his death with composure. And somebody has inserted before composure, callous, right? Oh, isn't that fantastic though? I mean, if you wanted your enemies to say anything of you, it would be precisely that you went, you know, you went, you went not the, in that maudlin sound, but you just went, you said, ah, to help you. You know, so, um, <clears throat> but as I say, in, in the tradition, in the, in the public narrative, uh, there's a much less interesting and more sort of uh, saintly air, air to him. Well, that's Uncle Kevin. Uh, but but he, I, I, I don't want to be nasty about him, but he, he, it, it is extraordinary how in, in a, in a, a, on both sides of the family where there were a lot of activists, and not, I mean, it's not that special, like Tom's wife, more is later Tony Woods. Uh, more. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, do you, do you know, Tony Woods, the famous gunman, and a very balanced, sane per person. Most of the gunmen I've ever met from the Irish Revolution where it didn't go crazy. They didn't sort of get the jitters of shell shock. Most of them didn't. Most of them became uh, upright citizens, civil servants, tax collectors, insurance agents, or whatever. But in night, we know, particularly from recently released material, like what's called the Bureau of Military History Testimonies I'm talking about, we know that some of them took people out and shot them. We know, as I was saying, uh, in Cork, the, a man who afterwards captained uh, Cork to three All-Ireland successes, right? In 1920, he and other guys spot a 15-year-old boy stalking them. He's a southern Englishman. They take the boy away. They talk to me. The, Mike, this man, Matt Murphy, described him as the most talkative person I've ever met, this kid. He chatted away and chatted away and chatted away. They took away. He chatted away for a few days. Then they killed him. As an informer. Right? And yes, he went on, if you call it. You know, he went on to be a, a pillar of the community, this man. And was sufficiently... Confident of what he'd done, that, that he made, you know, he left a testimony about it and why he had done it. It's extraordinary. <coughs> anyway, back back to uh, who killed who and why. Um, I just want to show you a picture of Judge Lennon. Yeah, we've had enough of Kevin Barry, I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, so so we, we have the problem with, or I have the problem of why why in my family was it simply my grandmother who was a very uh, formidable figure. Uh, her husband, uh, Jim Maloney, my grandfather, the son of a Sinn Féin TD, was a much quieter man, um, never <coughs> spoke much about the War of Independence or Civil War, although he told me a few things in a very sort of clipped way, uh, thinking about being on hunger strike and uh, about uh, shooting two so people in the Civil War. But he didn't say if he killed them, but he shot them when they burst into a house, and things like that. But, 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 but yet his whole, his whole family narrative never really got a look in, the whole temporary side of, of, uh, of, of, of things. And even, even though the, the sources on that uh, are excellent. And we never really heard, as I say, about his brother who got killed. He got killed not in, in, as a kind of celebrity student. He got killed in a gunfight outside Tipperary Town. And we never even went as a monument to him and the guy who was killed with. Uh, there, that's outside, I can zoom in, it just says. But I never saw that as a kid. I'm mean, not blaming my mother at all. But it just wasn't, as I say, my grandmother wasn't interested. You know, he was just another son-in-law. You're dying a dozen. He was killed with a man. Actually, he was a manager of a shop, Duffy from Monaghan. And in fact, my grandfather, Jim Maloney, then took over as adjutant of the, the, uh, the, the third, uh, fourth battalion, whatever, the third temporary brigade. 
But we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't hear about that. Again, there is a memorial now, which is, I, was, I offended some people at the opening. Um, I spoke at the unveiling of this memorial in 2003, and I remarked that uh, there was an audience like you wondering when I was going to get to the point or whatever. And I remarked, that, of course, most of the people, there's probably more people in the audience who, who had family killed on the other side, you know, as policemen or whatever. And people looked, looked deeply unhappy at this suggestion. But it's probably true, you know, because people, most of the people who die in the Irish Revolution on both sides, certainly, certainly outside uh, Ulster, if you like, are, are typically Catholic and they're typically Irish, right? The police, most of the police obviously are, are, uh, are um, from, from, uh, from there. The first killings of the Irish War of Independence at, at Sola Headbeg outside Tipperary Town, at the time that happened, uh, the, the, the brigade headquarters, and I have documents showing that, for, for the group who did that was my great-grandfather's shop, his, his pharmacy. Uh, I can show you a photograph of his pharmacy here. This is after it had been visited by unspecified, obviously, the police. They torched it at the end of 1920. And my great-grandmother, I've been shown a, a very bad copy of a letter from her, an indignant letter saying that, and so one of them was in our shop I don't know how many times. She knew well who it was. But on the other hand, that was the place when two, one elderly and one middle-aged inoffensive policemen were shot dead in January 1919 when they could easily have been disarmed by, by people whose, whose headquarters that premises, premises was. Um, I, I haven't been able to date that yet, I, but it certainly got, got burnt down and never got this a little patty. Uh, so I'll just show you, show you the picture of him simply to say he, he died too, but as a, at the time in 2001, I, you probably don't know this, but there was a, what's called a state funeral for, for, for ten, 10 people, not, only nine of them IRA members. They were all called volunteers who were executed in Mount George during the War of Independence, of whom Kevin Barry's the most famous. And at that funeral, where I carried, helped carry Kevin Barry's coffin, and I said to my sister, what about Paddy Maloney? Her mother's other, I mean, my sister didn't know who, uh, who he was. You know, it's amazing. And that's within the family, and it's not a matter of the Civil War split or anything like that. It's just, as I say, well, it's my grandmother. It'd be easy to explain it if uh, we were all New York, uh, sort of Jewish family or whatever, where they, where they love this. But I find it, I find it baffling that, that you would know so little, little, little about them. So where do we start finding material about these people? And the answer is, to a large extent, uh, the Irish state, it, it, the Irish state, the British state, and the Northern Ireland state are, are providing increasingly, they hold material and they're increasingly rele releasing it. And that material makes it much, makes our understanding, uh, potentially our understanding of who died, when and why, uh, much greater, right? But it, it can be disturbing as well as, well as interesting. And um, I have here, I mentioned that, uh, Tom mentioned at the beginning, my project, uh, The Dead of the Irish Revolution. I have a brilliant postdoc, Dahi O'Curroin, uh, who's, who, who, who does the work on it. It was my idea. And um, what we're trying to do is figure out who died where, when, and why, right, between 1916 and 1923. Now, we've gone up to the end of 21 in, in effect, for we hope, for the first volume, uh, which, once we get a contract, we'll try to get out in the next year or so, right? And but what we're trying to do is, is triangulate people, if you like, not, not simply to take them on a list, but to link their deaths to other deaths, to uh, we have GIS data, so we can in the database we can map exactly where people, uh, where killings took place, and all that kind of stuff. But I have here, for example, my, my grandfather in a in a statement, which I will she probably won't see it here, doesn't go up very well. In his pension statement, he mentions a number of ambushes that he organised. Uh, one of them at Ula. Ula is in. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed it. You read that? Yeah. Now the point is, this is a verbatim tra transcript. It's amazing. But the only reason I was able to get that is because I'm a relative, right? And there are thousands and thousands of these pensions files. And if everybody's quizzed in detail, right, you can see it's just much better than some old thing. Oh, I remember the night of the big wind and I was a hero and we killed seven with one blow. These are serious questions being asked of somebody because he's looking for money from the state in a period when the state didn't like giving money, right? 
uh, Paddy Warren. So, Lawash, they're asking him questions. What do you do? Uh, Bansha, that's, that's one of the things you organise. Uh, uh, there's uh, Bansha, Dan Breen, Ernie O'Malley, these are people involved who are well known. Sorry. I'm just looking for Ula. Anyway, if we don't find Ula here, it's like, so he mentions that he organised two attacks at Ula. And we know, I have here this chap, who's a British soldier, who's one of them. Now, I don't have a photograph of him yet. But here, so here's a man. Well, he's 18. He's, he's British, so he's a man. Uh, uh, so here's, here's a chap gets killed as a result of my grandfather's efforts. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but once we get the photograph, as we probably will in some regimental uh, magazine or something like that. It adds, it adds a, a, you know, it, it begs questions uh, about, um, well, you can put a face, a face on people. It makes it so much harder to, uh, to say, oh, well, they asked for him or whatever. Here's a 20-year-old, he's not. You can see these links there. Can you see that link? That's linked to the other one. So we, do you see what I'm doing? We're, we're linking the different deaths in different ways. Uh, but anyway, we don't have photographs yet of these people, but at some point we will. And uh, I mean, I don't think it's uh, prurient or whatever but, uh, to do, but it's sometimes unsettling to find that part of the fight for Irish freedom actually involves killing people. It's one thing to kill soldiers or policemen or, you know, Brits, but to kill people who are 17 or 18, or in the case of Kevin Barry, 15, right? The only son of a widow. This is Washington, the 15-year-old. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it, but it shows you uh, it can be a nasty business, uh, uh, death and, and killing. Um, now, so, so, so why, why are we now getting to the stage where we can find out so much about who dies and why? Well, it's because of, of different kind, kinds of records. The first, first series, uh, serious release of, of, of Irish records since the 1980s, I'd say, related to the Irish War of Independence, it uh, took place in 2003, when after a lot of lobbying by a lot of people, uh, including me, uh, the government released what's called the Bureau of Military History Papers, right? And the Bureau of Military History was set in the 1940s, and they went around to about 2,500 people who wished to give statements saying what they'd done during the War of Independence. Now, some of them did, did very little and said so at great length. Others did a lot. <laughs> Others did a lot and said very little. A lot of people didn't give statements at all. My grandfather didn't, for example. My grandmother did give a statement, but it's entirely about Kevin Barry. There's nothing about anything else. There's nothing about her own interesting life. There's nothing about anything. Nothing about the Civil War. Nothing. It's all just about the saint. Right? So they're very, they're very interesting, but they're very varied and, and uh, in quality and value. I'll just show you. There's one there from a guy in... Uh, you really see it? In, in, in Dublin, uh, called Bernard Nolan. Now, this is of interest to me. I, I didn't know this, but a, a, a student at Trinity, Eve Morrison, that has read all the statements. She's doing a PhD, and uh, she has now read over 2,000 of them. And uh, she found this. By chance, this guy is from Dublin. But he, he, he mentions. Can you read that? He, he, going to Belfast, but I was to make a to try and bid two men named Doran and, and Hayton. That's my grandfather, my father's father, uh, uh, who had a dispute amongst themselves. Both were IRA company leaders in uh, John Patrick, and they fell out or whatever. So, it, in the middle of this statement, which is otherwise about uh, this guy, uh, Nolan, and another guy getting shot in a kind of uh, pretend, uh, attempting to escape way, and the other guy dying, but you're getting something out of the blue. Thing about my family. Now, I would never have found that, because why would I read Nolan from Dublin looking for Haytney from, from County Down, right? But uh, uh, as I say, fortunately, because we were a PhD student doing it, she, she gave it to me. But anyway, these statements are very valuable and very interesting, but some, some are more interesting than others, right? And they're elicited uh, sometimes in the, the, the person, you know, getting the testimonies leads the person on and comes back and you can see they've said, well, come on, come on, what did you really do, what was it like? And other times, my grandmother came in with a written statement, right? And then she comes in, you can see, she comes in at the next week with an addition. So there's no question of the, of the person saying, yeah, but what did you do or what did you think and what else happened? It's completely just a kind of gravestone, right? And it's, it's pretty, pretty, 
It's interesting in his way, but it's simply the standard version that she wants, of, of, wants about her brother's death. Uh, where, where, so, so some of these, these statements are some ways, a lot of them are very problematic. Do you know what I mean? And they're in the, a lot of hindsight and so on. So the, the push now is to try to get the pensions files released. I showed you an extract from the pensions file there. I got my grandfather's pension file because I'm a relative. Okay? But the state is still afraid. The world will end if you know, your grandfather's pensions file was to be opened. Right? I mean, you can see it would be. What would happen? The answer is nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. And yet the state are still, still uh, very afraid about it. I'll show you an example. Uh, the union, would it be illness or would it be heading line? No, it's not, it's, not like the, it's not as subtle as that, Tom. It's just that they're, they're afraid that somebody in Valley McGash would be offended if, if, for example, this is my grandfather's thing. My, uh, if, now, my grandfather's thing, he comes out very well from it, so I'll show you it. But if they say, well, that Tom Garvin was an awful waster, he's not, you know, he's not worth, worth tuppence, right? As some of them would do, you know, which is why lots of them were, were rejected or why people only got, you know, service for... for uh, a small amount. The other thing is medals files. There are lots of medals. There's more of independence medals, you know, which the state gave. But everybody, everybody, there's more, far more medals awarded than ever, you know, carried a gun or did anything in the, in the War of Independence. And similarly, there's far more military service pensions. But the point about this, this thing is, I showed you my grandfather's inquisition. But here's Bill Quirk, who's a well-known uh, Political figure, Tipperary, and a well known IRA man, and Sean Fitzpatrick, who was the sort of top cheese. So they're, they're asking about my grandfather, right? And they're, they're asking reasonably serious questions. You see what I mean? Went to Tipperary, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'll give you an example. Was he, what was the value certainly exceptionally good? Who would you compare him with in that period? And they say, should, shouldn't be comparison case of his kind. He stands out. You couldn't compare him with Jack Sharkey, whoever he is. We've got seven years, that means on his pension. He's the first class man in the fall of the Sinn Féin TD, and they're all in it. The House of the Times Brigade headquarters, uh, practically, it was Brigade headquarters at the time of Solid Headbag, which had started the war. And it goes on. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, the point is, this is a kind of, but it's, it's, it's an effort to get beyond some bland thing of saying, oh yeah, he was a great man. Do you know what I mean? And it's very valuable for that reason. And when, when it's put it beside, uh, when it's put beside uh, the, their inquisition of him, you get, you get quite a detailed account of what this man did and didn't do in comparison with other people and so on. And uh, I mean, I, I, I'm a former, I have four civil servants here. I was a civil servant, so I love this bit here. What the committee get really exercised about is this bit here, which is the start of the Civil War, right? Because they're worried... He, my grandfather was appointed to the staff. Liam Lynch, the anti-treaty leader, made him, made him a, a staff officer. But the big question is, was it, on, was it on the 1st or the 2nd of July? I think you'd agree it's enormously important. Because if, uh, uh, you see, the big problem is, is that they might, somebody else might get, be paid an extra day. Or he might be paid an extra day or somebody else is owed. You know, it's just crazy. But you can see, uh, again, my grandfather didn't talk much. That's the start of the Civil War. Oh, yes, I'm, oh I, you called him Lynn Lynch very late on the 1st July. Con Maloney, that's his brother, who was Lynch's deputy, uh, returned to Tipperary, collected a thousand pound, pounds, whatever that was, from Second Southern Division. There might be somebody else came in the rank. All I know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so that's my, my, in a sense, my grandfather's story as told from his pensions file. And it's much more interesting and much fuller than you're going to get from probably 10 different witness statements, right? Uh, I have, just to show you again, I don't know, have you ever used Ernie O'Malley's papers, Tom? No. Okay, well, here's a reference. I won't, I won't, I won't, uh, I can hardly read oh, it. Sorry, I have, sorry, yeah. The handwriting is awful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, it must have been Jesuit educated like me. He got, he got, tra got transcribed a lot of it, I think. Um, uh, but anyway, the, the, there's a reference there, and again, it's a very full reference, and says, yes, he's good, and so on. Mm. So, but this material only comes to me as a relative. It doesn't come to, it should be, belong to the public, right? And the state won't release it. I wrote a thing in the Sunday Business Post about 1916, and I put this in. And they're, they're moving towards trying to release it. But the fear that paralyzes them isn't, even as I say, the health issue. It's just somebody might be offended, right? From what happened, uh, what, is this 2006? 
80, is 80 or 90? I don't know. It was a long time ago, even before I was born. It's that far back. Right? Well, I was born. Yeah, well, really? I thought you were uh, I thought you were uh, in the queue in the post office in 1960. And um, so so uh, because of my uh, my grandma's particular take on things, I think, and because her, her, her sacred brother, we we as a family, and particularly me as a young kid interested in history, I just never picked up even on what my grandfather did, let alone his, his father, I'd say it was Sinn Féin TD, and let alone his brother Paddy killed, or his brother Colm, uh, who was at the end was the deputy, Leo Lynch, the anti-treaty military leader, uh, was his deputy until he was captured. Um, and it's, it's, it's now I'm recovering this material largely through official records, right? And the, what the official <coughs> records do, and it's even more the case with the complete unknowns of the, of the Haitney side of the family, the, what's now the Orhalpins, is they, 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 the official material acts as a trigger with relatives, right, who, who finally dust off stuff that's been there for generations. And they say, oh, yeah, there's some old thing here. And I'll give you an example of that, uh, where, where, um, uh, where, you, where you get very interesting material, which families have. The families are very bad. You think families are good at family? We, can, we can't even keep family secrets, and we certainly can't keep family records, right? We try to. You know, and you, this is grandfathers, and you keep it, and then your kids, and somebody moves house, and you know, and it's only old cuttings anyway. And you know, it's, it's all messy, and there's cobwebs, or whatever. I have very interesting material from, from, uh, from this is true, from, from a chicken hut in, in, uh, in Cavan, uh, which, which is a lot of material. It's actually, it's by the modern IRA. I'll just give you an example, which a, a, a relation of mine, his father, uh, wrote this account of the War of Independence in Monaghan, which would be a slim volume, since nothing much happened in Monaghan except they, they, they did a lot of, uh, they shot a lot of supposed informers, they shot very few policemen or soldiers. But this is a very harrowing uh, thing, this is towards the end of his account. Early in 21, the brigade received a valuable ally, the person of Fred McHenry, um, the supervisor in Monaghan post office. He extracted all letters addressed to RAC, that's the police and military, uh, some very startling stories emerged, uh, giving information about the movements of IRA and others, others stating that the local curate at Tudabnet, which is near the border, uh, was a member of IRA. One case in particular giving information about, about where IRA had, had something, arms dumps and where the boys stopped at night. This person, Kate Carroll, who, who was a penniless putching maker, she was an impoverished Protestant, the daughter of really poor, poor farmers. And she was a halfwit, right? We know this because, as I say, her case has been written about by Fergal McGarry in his book on Ono Duffy and by Anne Dolan in an essay which is coming out. This adds to it. Anyway, she, she, she was writing. She kept writing to the police. Apparently, the, the folk story is that she, she had a crush on the local police sergeant, so she kept writing to him. And, of course, the IRA were intercepting these letters, right? But she was, she was just a head case, and everybody knew it. Anyway, it goes on... Uh, uh, the case was investigated uh, by the battalion I.O. T.B., who's the man who wrote this. He puts it in third person. Uh, uh, T.B. found that the letter, letter written by Kate Carroll, case reported to Brigade O.C., who was the, the, uh, the future fascist maniac, uh, uh, who was got off until Fergal McGarry put very lightly in Irish history, Owen Duffy, first president of the Fine Gael Party. I don't want to be partisan, but they, they mustn't forget him. <laughs> um, uh, O'Duffy was very keen on, on shooting uh, shooting on other people shooting people. Um, uh, Reformed Brigade, who, who, said, who sent to, to, to two men to warn her to stop, stop that at once, our serious, uh, serious notice would later be taken of it, right? Uh, uh, she, she denied all knowledge, but proof was forthcoming next day when another, uh, when another, another letter denouncing the man who had give, men who had given her the warning, and he writes, etc. He doesn't, he doesn't want to say, he just stops there. Because what did they do? They took her and they shot her, right? And that's, I mean, that's, that's a, a famous, but not in a sense an isolated case. Uh, there's an awful lot of people in court. There's a book coming out by an American guy called John Borgonovo, uh, who did an MA in court some years ago, and he, he's now updated it using these bureau statements. And it's about killings in Cork uh, in 1920 and 21 in Cork City. And it's an absolutely horrible, disturbing book, but you should read it. Because he's using these, these different statements of, of why the IRA in Cork thought it was a sensible thing to shoot uh, a B, you know, what, what, B instructor, 
what would you call that? Somebody who teaches whatever the art of raising bees is. A civil servant, a Protestant, and his son. And they're suspected of collecting information for the authorities. And now it's clear from the narrative that the son wasn't involved, but they'd taken him as well. So they take them away for a few days. The father, Blemons, whatever his name is, James Blemons, apparently he's very drunk at the time of his death. They probably fill him full of drink. They shoot him and they shoot the son as well. Because. And that's a weird, you know, to shoot bloodlines. Shoot two generations. It's very strange. Uh, and a very kind of strange almost pathology of death. Uh, which emerges, and that material is, is ascertainable mainly partly through folklore, which is uncertain, but also through things like the Bureau of Military History and other, other uh, releases, which are, uh, I won't go on much longer, which, which, are, um, which have only come out in the last few years. But again, the picture won't, in a sense, ever be complete, but we'll be much nearer completion when we can get the pension records. I say the pension files are much more valuable than people seem to realise because of, of, for the reasons I've shown you, that there is interrogation, there is elicitation, there, is, uh, there are confidential references, and so on. And there are comparisons. Was he as good as Smith? Do you know what I mean? So we've got to get them out there, folks. So the more, why don't we just write a letter now? Um, I'll just say briefly, my, my, the, the great unknowns, my, um, my northern uh, grandfather uh, was um, uh, Hugh Hapney. He had to leave in May 1922 because he, was, he would have been interned uh, there's, I only found all these family narratives recently because what happens, I found, I found records in Belfast about him, sent them to my uncles who said, oh yeah, that's very interesting, did you know such and such? And of course I didn't know such and such uh, about, about this man and, and his, uh, his, his life. But for example, this, this is the file, the interment file of, of his number two, okay, who, was, who, was, who did stay in the north and was interned, Tommy Brannigan. And in the interment file, you find, this isn't very well photographed, I've got much better at digital photography, it's the early days. You find extracts from letters sent to the prisoners, okay? Now all letters are subject to censorship, okay? And in fact, yeah, you have to send them on a postcard. So, so, the, so the Northern Ireland government have kept a record of anything remotely uh, political or whatever that, that comes to or is written by a prisoner and it's sitting in, in, in the, the file of the individual prisoners. So this is a letter to, to Tommy Brandigan from somebody was obviously an anti-treaties in Tin Town, in the Curra. Uh, so he's, he's taken the anti treaty side of the Civil War and he's been, been caught. And he goes on here, uh, we're far apart from the last 18 months, and, and he goes on and on and on. And uh, he's giving out about, about locals, including my grandfather. Uh, he talks about uh, the cringing cowards, one of whom uh, went to jail, that was my grandfather, but was released uh, automatically. And after a period of espionage and some of his old pals myself included, has eventually blossomed out as a member of the new RIC in Dublin. My grandfather had become a, a police sergeant. I cannot say all I'd like to say about HH, that's my grandfather, or any of that clique. A lot of mean, cowardly curs, the whole bunch of them, who for a time endeavoured to flaunt or boost themselves as, bravado, as bravados to those who hadn't sufficient intelligence to know the difference. And it goes on. So uh, he obviously wasn't a fan of my poor grandfather. But here's an extract. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you could re read this, but this is an extract of, of, of a letter from my grandfather to Tommy Brannigan saying why he changed his mind about the treaty. Right? Now, where else, where else would you find that? You know, he, for a start, my grandfather wrote it, so he wouldn't have kept a copy. He was just an ordinary farmer. And uh, Tommy Brannigan, whoever he is, probably would have lost it, whatever. But well, thanks to the, uh, if you like, the, the uh, intrusive state, it's all sitting, sitting. Uh, t telling me much more than I would otherwise know ab about uh, sitting, in, sitting in a, in a, in a, in a basic police file uh, in Belfast. And all it goes, I have various other ones just briefly. That's Dan Rice, my granny's brother, uh, who, uh, again, there's, there's material in there. There's a letter from my grandmother, an extract from a letter from my grandmother about two weeks after my father was born, right? And she, it simply says, I, she says, I hear you, I see you were going barefoot. I hope it wasn't a punishment. But that's an extract of a letter which almost certainly begins by saying, hey, I've just had a baby, and his name is Paul Jean. You know, I guess. Uh, Granny, he was the eldest, her, her first child. She only had 12 more, because her, her husband died when she was 37. I often think it was with mixed feelings that she saw him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was only, uh, and my grandpa died, died of Bryce disease. And the family thing there was always that he got that, kidney disease. He got that from being beaten up uh, in prison. 
But, uh, but the curious thing is, all left outside of the family were, became, uh, well, they became devil airites and feet of oil. So uh, there was no uh, sort of continuing sort of Republican link other than constitutional Republican. This man, Dan Rice, came back to Northern Ireland, uh, said to the authorities, I, don't, I stepped away from the Civil War down south, I'm going to come back, uh, I'm going to behave myself, I won't sign anything, but I won't make trouble. So they interned him for two years, right? Uh, there's another file which I got declassified with my grandfather's name on it. It turned out he was a leader of a group who wanted to do the same thing. We'll come back, we won't sign anything, but we'll give you our word. And the Northern Ireland government would say no, right? Uh, so it turns out that states, very often, I would argue, are, are better custodians of, of the, certainly the, the Irish case, of the history of the Irish Revolution, than individual families are, and so on. I think it also turns out, in the case of certainly my, my, my grandmother, that where you have one iconic figure uh, like Kevin Barry, he does so, uh, so overshadow uh, the. Um, uh, this is another one. Uh, so, so overshadow the rest of it that you just didn't hear of what's actually a much more interesting and complex story, right? Both in terms of, of, of uh, County Tipperary, where my grandfather was from, uh, and in terms of, of County Down, where my father's father was from, and my granny, and so on as well. Just finally, I'd say, uh, in terms of just strange uh, matters, one of the things my grandfather organized accidentally, and apparently he always, he and Brannigan always spoke of this with regret, but they, they shot a Protestant clergyman during a raid here. This is from the English Times. And uh, the, 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 is this a message? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think, uh, they, he was shot incidentally because they thought he had a rifle. And they didn't realize he was a clergyman. But it was one of, one of the sort of, uh, uh, even at the time, it was seen to be a taboo thing. And I don't know if they shot any children, for example. But shooting a clergyman was clearly always there as, as a terrible thing to have happened and so on. Now, I've got on probably too long. I haven't made much sense yet. I have got a conclusion, uh, but I'm not sure if, if I want to uh, uh, give it to you. But really, uh, what I want to say is that it, it's because of the work, my colleague Anne Dolan, for example, who'll be talking to you, and um, Eve Morrison, who's just completed a, completing a PhD on the Bureau of Military History statements and so on, it's becoming more, not less, as we, as we move further away, more, not less possible, that more easier sorry, rather than harder, to elicit more information about what went on uh, in those terrible years, uh, our glorious years, if you prefer, from 1916 to 1923. Uh, but the key to, to, to most of this, not all of it, is that the state, both in, in, in my case, I've shown you the Northern Ireland state, there's some British material as well, but mainly the Irish state it, it holds the key to a, to a much greater and more nuanced understanding, both of, if you like, the family narratives and more generally of the nature of violence uh, in the Irish Revolution. And of course, the great mystery about the Irish Revolution, which, it, which, which was simply that once, once, once the, the Civil War ended, almost nothing happened. Did all these people, some of whom would say, done, you know, done terrible things, Sean the Mass, Game Taoiseach, a quiet man never talked about it. But he'd been out on Bloody Sunday, he'd shot, shot, you know, shot a man in his bed. But they didn't, uh, Ireland didn't turn, it didn't become like, you know, South Los Angeles are anywhere in America. It didn't develop a gun culture, even though everybody had guns, right? Uh, Irish society just became incredibly peaceful incredibly quickly. And lots of people who, who had done terrible things in the name of Ireland or whatever, uh, it somehow found a way of getting on with their lives. But that often involved not talking, you know, not going back. I've, I've met lots of people from the Irish Troubles, but equally lots of people who've been involved in wars everywhere, and a lot of them aren't innocent in talking about it, for good reason, not because of shame or trauma, but just because, just because they don't talk about it. But as, as, they, as they die off, and most of them are gone now, I think there's probably two people left who were involved in the Irish War of Independence. One is Sean Clancy, you know? Yes, I know Sean. Yeah, who's 104 now, I think. I bought him a double paddy one, and he brought me one back. Right, well, that's okay. He's a lovely fellow. And uh, I, I think there's, there's some, someone else I, who, I, who I've never met. Um, but we as historians, and those instances, we, we, we can't accept, or we shouldn't accept any longer, the paradox that the Irish state, particularly with pensions materials and with medals, has all this material that would so add to our understanding. In some cases, 
you know, they'll say Garvin's a blackguard or whatever, don't give him a penny, or you know, he was a cheat or an informer. But the state has it, and it's the very state which the Irish state takes a particular uh, awkward but particular pride in, in claiming the legacy of 1916, claiming the legacy of the War of Independence, partly to stop the provost claiming it, yeah. right? But the records are there, but they still won't release them. So when you write a letter to Mr. Hearn complaining about me, add, but you should release those files now. I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>
It's not state secrecy, it's privacy. But you can, the way you can deal with that is you, 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 you redact, you take out the medical report, right? It's pretty simple, you know. I mean, uh, just to say on the, on the justice material um, with, with internees, well, one of the issues that comes out with people in turn during the war uh, is, um, I'll give you an example of, of which, an un unintended, I opened a, three or four linked files about four IRA men who, who are jailed in 1942 and then interned. And what, they're unlucky, they're caught in Cork City beating a fella up. And it looks, oh, this is the IRA, you know, we, 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 we jail them for a while and then you intern them. But when you open the file and read it, who are they beating up? They're beating up some guy. Why are they beating them up? I'll tell you why. Because a, a, a former internee had a <coughs> sister. The sister who wasn't married, probably her ears, ladies, had a child. Right? And got a paternity order. Okay? And the guy that these guys were beaten up was one of a number of guys whom, whom the guy against the order being issued had, had persuaded to go to court to say, oh yeah, we all had sex with her. Right? Do you see what I mean? So that file can't unfortunately be released because the kid, the daughter <laughs> concerned, was born in 1942, so she's probably still there. So it wouldn't be right. You know, unless you, you know, you'd probably have to keep those files back nearly in their entirety for perhaps another 50 years. But it's not because of about state security. It's because, of the, you know, while these are IRA men, there's another file about fellas, three brothers who keep getting into trouble. Uh, I, I better not even say where. And when you read the file, it's amazing. Because they're, they're doing it, they're taking their, they're in the IRA and they got guns, but they're just, just, just a land dispute. And the minister actually writes, he said, this isn't. This, we shouldn't be interning these guys because this is the land dispute. But the old, they keep letting them out and they just go back. They, they sabotage the old treasures. They put boats. It's very dangerous and, and these old treasures will fly out. And they're just crazy. And the, the local sergeant tries to uh, manipulate things to, to make it easier for them. There's hope when they buy a little bit of land that their land hunger will die away. But it doesn't. These brothers are just mad about this grievance that their father had when an estate was broken up. And they, because they use the IRA mantle, in the sense they give the state, the state is then able to lock them up as IRA men, but the state doesn't want to. Jerry Bold is very clear, he said, this is ridiculous. But the problem is when you give them a chance. Now that, again, that file, that file can be released, because it's, you know, there's nothing uh, sensitive there, but it's complete, the, the real story is so completely different than you would, you know, than, than opening the file that you'd expect. You know? Right. Sorry, yeah? Uh, in the United States we have Freedom of Information Act, where, where political dissidents can uh, request their police files or from the government. Uh, do they have that, or is it talking like that in, in Ireland? Uh, well, well the, we, 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 we have quite a, an owner of Freedom of Information Act now, right? But, uh, but, but there, is a, there is a security op, you know, uh, out, if you like, so, so you won't be able to get a police file. You can get a lot of policy files, but you, can't, you won't be able to get material. Uh, relating to, to criminal matters or to security matters, right? Um, but I mean, if you look at the American FOI, I mean, a lot of people put their files up on the web and that, you know, these, with these redactions and things which the state has made before they release them. And some, some of them are, are, are very useful. Um, but I mean, even if, if we now have, as we do Freedom of Information, we do have an Archives Act and so on, it becomes increasingly ludicrous that you can get recent material, all right, not security material, you can get material from last week with FOI in, 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 in Ireland. But you can't get something that's 80 years old. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's really uh, even though, as I say, I, in the justice case, I have to say that there's a real, there's a real, real issues with, with it files about individuals because of, not because of subversion, uh, but because of their, their medical record or whatever. I'd like to ask, through you, uh, you, through you I'd like to ask the Americans, uh, does anyone know anything about American Civil War pension files? Anyone know anything about them at all? I remember reading about them years and years ago that for years afterwards the, the grateful states on both sides uh, were paying off, paying off the grand old army of the Republic and the, uh, the, the noble sons of the South as well, uh, right up to 1910, 1920, 1930. Uh, does any, is anyone aware of any study of that kind? That would be a parallel to what Unions seem to be getting that into gradually. No, pension files are great. Yeah. Uh, just on a, a, a slight aside, but when I started working on British intelligence history in the early 80s, 
it was because I, one of the places I figured out in my, because you didn't get any intelligence <coughs> records at the time, the organisations formerly didn't exist, there was nothing, they, all the files were weeded, the material sent to the Foreign Office. But I started looking at Treasury establishment files, personnel files, and pensions, right? Because spies need pensions, mm -hmm. and spies need premises. And I found quite a lot of material, most of which I gave to Christopher Andrew, yeah. right? But so, so the pensions are real. You know, your pension is, you want to hear my pension? I've got a pension story, it's a harrowing story. <laughs> you know, about, I, 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 my view is I'm missing five months or something service that <laughs> like change jobs or something. You know, it's a real, you know, they're really, really gripping narratives when you get into it. And uh, as I say, these, these, I think, we have to try and get them out, you know. There was a strange woman in France, several strange women, but yes. there was a very strange lady called Bernard who was in charge of all the pensions in my time in finance. Even Whitaker, Ken Whitaker, the head of the civil service, was terrified of her, uh, allegedly. And uh, when a file went into her office, it never came out again. Right. You know, have those files all been transferred, or did she do something strange with them? Or? I'd say a lot of uh, I got the impression that she uh, uh, sometimes awarded pensions or refused them quite arbitrarily. Yeah. Well, I think if you're a pensions I minister, there must be some consolation. Pensions <laughs> administrator, and there must be one of the quiet, quiet joys. You have um, uh, pensions files. I mean, I, 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 with with other editors, we edit the Irish Foreign Policy Archive, right, and publish it. And we're not allowed to see personnel files. This is just our researchers aren't allowed to see person. This is just ludicrous, right? Now sometimes they do see them, and well, there's, with personnel files, it's usually with an Irish diplomat. What's in the personnel file? What's the problem? Booze, right? Normally it's booze. Very occasionally, uh, there's something more exotic, uh, like somebody of the opposite sex or the same sex or whatever. By and large, I'm just guessing. That's what that's what's in it. The early years, of the stage, right? Booze is a big thing. And um, but but sometimes in a personnel file, you're going to get what's really part of the official narrative. You're going to get a document that's been that's look. Here's an example of what I was doing at the time. Here's an account of my service in Bogota. Do you know what I mean? Right? Which actually isn't isn't you know isn't smeared with whiskey, and, <laughs> and is useful, but because in a personnel file they say no you can't touch touch it it's ridiculous, but that's that's a separate separate problem. So, yeah. Um, on the U.S. Civil War pensions, one thing you might look at is I, I don't remember who wrote it, but the latest uh, biography of Harriet Tubman because there they talk quite a bit about her trying to get a pension and they use some records there, okay. um, you know where they quote from the records about her trying to get it, so they probably, you know, in the yeah. biography would give you some information. Would it be at state that. level or would it be federal? I think it's federal. I think it's federal. Yeah. Yeah. federal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She was, uh, you know, she, she, she had a rank, but then people were disputing whether she actually okay. had a rank, so there was a... Um, but there you'd have a problem with the Southerners. And she finally yeah. did get a pension, so uh, that correspondence <coughs> would be what noted in... But the Confederate stuff would only be available at state level if it exists at all. But presumably. she was a Confederate. I know, I know, but if you want, if you're interested in the other side. Oh, okay, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Plus there's a Kevin Barry pub in Savannah, in Georgia. I found it on the web, I haven't been there. That's of his famous spread. Um, uh, rather extraordinary. So, this you know, uh, parallels the question about our Confederate were any treaty people able to claim pensions? Well, you see, this is the interesting thing. Is there's a number of pensions acts. First act is 24, so that's for pro-treaty, okay? So people like my grandfather couldn't. But then Fianna Fáil came in and, and into, into office. So in 34, there's a new pensions act, which is for people who didn't apply under the, the previous South regime. Rose again. Right? <laughs> and there's, finally, there's one in 1948, when the inter-party government comes in, you've shown a bride in there. So there's another Pensions Act in 49 for the people who wouldn't even recognise the Fianna Fáil state. So there's actually three series of, uh, of things, but the, 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 the bulk of them would be, would be uh, the Free State one and then, if you like, the Fianna Fáil one. And there'll be, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of files. You know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, and there are a lot of pensions given out, but there are a lot more people applying. Did you have to be a resident in Ireland to claim a pension? No. There quite a few anti-treaty people end up on this side. Yeah, that's a good question. You certainly could be in Northern Ireland, because like Tommy Brandingham got one. He, he's in the North. Um, whether you have to... Uh, I shouldn't think so. I don't think so. I, I the principle of service, so. not uh, 
No, no, no res res residency. I mean, it was still, my, my grandfather, uh, Jim Maloney, his file, he qualified, his studies were interrupted, obviously, by the Civil War, Independence Civil War. He qualified as a pharmacist. He then opened up in the poor part of Dublin and went bust. He actually never got a job. He couldn't get a job in 1928, 1934. But he could, he could have kids, or his wife could, my grandmother. She had five children in four years or something. And then she ends up, because of her imperious nature, even though my grandmother didn't recognise the state, she refused to speak to Del all this kind of stuff. And, and certainly wasn't going to talk about the Cosgrave law. But she, she, she got a job at the ESB, the electricity company, from McLaughlin, the guy who set it up. She grabbed him into giving her a job, because she was the sister of the martyr, uh, and, and uh, you know, kept, kept the show on the road. But when, then in, in my grandfather's pensions file, and my grandfather said she used to cut all these people dead. But in the pensions file, there's a note saying the minister, Mrs. Maloney has been in to see the minister, and the minister asked that, that uh, the pensions applications be expedited uh, for her husband James and her brother Mick Barry. You know, so when she well, when she had to, she would uh, call in old favours. Hmm? Take soup. Well, take soup, yes, but, but you know, uh, as long as you didn't enjoy it. Um, <laughs> but she's, I mean, they did, but I, I mean, the, the, the family end of it is the strange thing that, that this woman's brother was so important that no one else's suffering mattered. Do you know what I mean? My, well, my grandfather was, was on hunger. He was rather proud of this. I, this only came out in 1980 during the hunger strikes. He was on hunger strike for 35 days, and they, his, his, he was, uh, he was the sort of the prisoner's commander or whatever. He was a senior officer, in, and he was in Hare Park, and they didn't break. You know, they, they broke in various places, and he was very proud uh, that they didn't break. And I said, "But well, Todd Andrews, because Andrews had been his second command, but he'd moved somewhere else." I said, well, "Andrews said blah 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 blah." He said, "Yeah, but Todd Andrews went off the strike, but we didn't." So at the end of his days, that was that was the thing he 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 felt very strongly about. But I never heard about that till till 1980. I was talking to him long after his wife had died. You know, it's uh, it's the same for everybody. About you know, you tell your kids they you know the kids don't listen and all that kind of stuff. But but it, it's it's uh, what I find now with the kind of material I, I have here. Uh, showing it around relatives, you suddenly get material coming into you that they've had all along, or stories they've had all along, but they never, you know, just never sort of gelled or came together, uh, uh, together at all. I, yeah. I, I shouldn't be asking any more questions. There's somebody over there, but just very quickly, a lot of people refused pensions. Yeah, my well, private. Uh, uh, didn't apply. They didn't recognise the stage around like that. They just didn't want any pension. Yeah. yeah, I heard that. I have a lot of casual appearances. That's right. Well, well my, my, my grandfather, the, the, my father's father, according to my granny, didn't, didn't apply. But he wrote, he was on a board for, uh, that took decisions in relation to, to Northern Ireland, basically. Uh, but he was a rich man, he was a garden sergeant. 13 children. God. Sorry, yeah. Do you think some of the sensitivity around releasing the material is to do with the sort of pro treaty, anti treaty? So, you know, is there, there's still sort of a deep sense of division, you know, even sort of the remnants of it still seem to be hanging on a long time after the fact. Is yeah, I, I, part of it? I, I don't think, I mean, it's a good point, but I don't, I don't think it is part of it. I think this is now just, it's so long ago, nobody almost knows what's in these things anymore. And now, to see, there's a, the Department of Justice is much more sensitive. Because the minister, we, you know, we, the minister's very accessible. We know him anyway uh, from college and things. So he, he, he got interested in this thing of, of yeah, let's release all this stuff. But we have to do a screening first. Um, but it's not, it's not to do with, with, with politics in the sense of the, the legacy of civil war or treaty or anything like that at all. But I think it is, I mean, I, I think, for example, with an election coming, our, Irish politicians might be nervous if they thought about it, if it turned out the files were going to come out, that somebody was going to show that somebody's grandfather was a complete rogue and trickster, which, of course, he, he probably was. <laughs> but the reality is, nobody notices, nobody cares when this kind of material is released. You know, the governments don't collapse over this kind of stuff. You know, we write articles in journals, which, which uh, nobody reads either. Well, some people read them. We write books, which nobody can read. <laughs> and, and, you know, the world doesn't, the world doesn't, the world just goes on. Says, oh yeah, so so it's nobody's going to get hurt by 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 release subject to as I say to privacy material. 
But what you don't want, where there is confidential stuff, say medical stuff, you don't want that to become an excuse, which historically is what has happened. Because there's one page in a, in a file that says so-and-so has VD. And that means the whole file is locked up for 100 years, which has been the default position, not only in Ireland, but with archives generally. And you want to figure with, with, with digital technology and that. You want to just get away from that and say, OK, we take that bit off. We leave a marker to show something has been removed, which is very important you know, for the integrity of the file, and we put it, we put it, we put it in the public domain. You, know, you, you, you have a standard rule, all medical material is, is being withheld. You know, something like that gets you around. But you don't use it as an excuse to keep the whole file closed. And that's not, in Ireland, that's the material that, the, there was a huge breakthrough in Irish archives in the 1980s because we got a National Archives Act, right? And secondly, because in, in the army there was just a brilliant man called Peter Young. Mm -hmm. God love the guy, he's yeah. 49, dropped dead. But he was a complete, he, although he was an archivist by training, he was a complete pirate. And he just, he just got all these records from all around the country uh, from, from military barracks and put them in, in the military archives and, and opened most of them straight away. He was brilliant, Peter. He, was, he broke every precept of his training as an archivist to the enormous benefit. Uh, of those of us who do research. And again, nobody's, nothing's happened. The, the world hasn't ended. There hasn't been a crisis. It's just that we know an awful lot more about the role of the Irish Army and Irish society, about the Civil War and so on, because Peter just got the stuff that Asher go on. And even when he wouldn't let you, let you look at stuff, he'd leave it there. He'd look at it anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> he didn't care. It was great. God love him. He wanted you to look at it. He, he did, of course. He wanted you. Yeah. As an archivist, I have to speak up for archivists. The first principle of archives work is archives are for use. So he was the only one doing it right if he let the archives out and be used. Here, here. It's everybody else that's wrong. Yes. Lock them up. The training is not to lock them up. The training is to make them available for use. Yeah, but I, I think historically they, in Ireland, because there's one, you, you see the other pioneer, you see a brilliant archive. But they have had, they've done all the training of archivists in Ireland, and they have, they had a very, in a sense, a, a, a proper, I'd say, a properly conservative approach in the training, and that's. I mean, because I do find in 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 in, in uh, I was saying it earlier to Rob, in American libraries, for example, American archives, it, it is quite a culture shock. Where I remember walking into the um, the Sterling Library is it in Yale yes. as a conference. I just walked in as usual. I hadn't said anything. I said, "Listen, I'm interested in doing a troll American diplomats." mid-century, and I want to say William Wise. And this woman called Judy Seat, who was a senior research architect, said, okay, yeah, hang on a second, what else do you want? And she went and, and found things to me and, and gave them to me. That doesn't happen in properly run archives, right. typically in, in Britain and Ireland, or Houston to. You know, they, oh, you're interested in that? They'd lock it up. <laughs> <laughs> We're still working. No, but I, I really think there is much more a customer sort of focus here. Uh, it, it doesn't mean you're nicer. <laughs> uh, but it means you're much more, but, but, uh, the, the idea is you get the stuff out there. I mean, the American National Archives, i just show you a little picture. I know you've got pictures. I, 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 just, I just took, uh, it's not a very good picture, but there's the U.S. National Archives. Where's that picture? Sorry, I'll go, go back. Just, uh, I, just, I just took that illicitly, because you wouldn't see that in a properly run archive in Ireland or Britain. You'd see one little folder saying, don't touch. <laughs> and very good, they just spilled the trolley. They yeah, said, here yeah. you are. Yeah. You want a photograph? That's fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. sign the collision damage waiver. But on the other hand, <laughs> the US National Archives, as you go out the little check thing, uh, you know, they're very rule bound. They, they will make you, you have to have paper now with two holes in it. I have paper old notes with one hole in the crisis, because the guy couldn't let me out. Even though it was obviously my handwriting and not a stone die, I had to go back up and get it re -holed, and then thing. But that guy, he also not only did he didn't have the discretion to let me out, but he had a gun. I'm oh, sorry, she had a gun. A gun, <laughs> right? So American archives, public archives have their have their. Have you been in Nara? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. That's our mecca. Oh yes. We all come from Nara. And did you have a gun? <laughs> well, I, went in, I went in as a visitor, they wouldn't let me carry my gun in, even though I was American. Right, right. <laughs> well, unless you bring your horse, presumably. It's <laughs> but it, it is, uh, there is a different culture, I think. And again, when you go into European archives, it, it's, it's stranger again. Um, you know, they're much more closed off, say, than Britain or Ireland. Uh, a lot, certainly a lot of European archives are. No, sorry, yeah? Uh, I just had a question. 
to bring up the uh, the American archives. I know. Have you done a search for all of American archives for the sources? I know in the Burns Library we have a transcript of a pension, and like in uh, University of Kansas, C. S. Haggerty's papers are there. Are they? Yeah. No, I so didn't know, know that. I mean, probably just for more prominent individuals, they might be. Yeah. Able to sort of find some links that way. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, and there must be more. I mean, uh, even than, than you've said, you know, dotted around the place. But but there should be a master. So there is a master set in Dublin, mm -hmm. but we just can't see it. It's actually in Galway, in the Department of Defence, sort of uh, pension section. But it, it's really, I mean, the material in it, I think, is really interesting and much more valuable than the Bureau stuff, which we did get released, because it's not prepared, kind of recited to testimony. And it's focused on the individual, what he or she did or didn't do, and did she really do it. And that's much more, and it's, uh, it's very frustrating that you can't get at it. But even without that, the... Uh, uh, Generally speaking, the, sto the story is getting better for research in recent Irish history. But the, 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 I think this is a big, a big push now to get. And now there is a committee, hooray, looking at this. But unfortunately, some of the people on the committee will be saying, mm, I don't know, I don't know. right? And we do all it needs to show. And I say, no one, no one in the end, nobody. Has, have you ever heard of a government collapsing on the issue of no? Oh, but the, I tried to get Theosa Hegarty's uh, little book from that kind of draw republished from UCD Press, and two members of the committee of UCD Press tried to veto it on the grounds that it would be uh, disturbing. <laughs> the book was published 80 years ago. It was published. This is what, the Triumph of Sinn Féin? Yeah. Yeah. The Victor Sinn Féin. Victor Sinn Féin. I mean, it's the same mentality. Uh, the two people who came from archive departments in UCD, uh, and folklore, in other words. Folklore people. Right. It's possible to be very dangerous and the Irish people would be permanently damaged collectively. Right. This, this little memoir that they published. Right. I don't understand the mentality, but there you are. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I have to say, UCD have the best of a fantastic archive, uh, and, and they are much more proactive mm -hmm. than they used to be, and much more user friendly. I've given them a lot. I gave them, just to have family history to, to, to end, I was always told there was no Kevin Barry papers, okay? When my uncle was selling my grandparents, Sorry, my uncle died who'd inherited my, we lived in England, who'd inherited my grandparents' house, okay, and then the aunt who lived in it died. So I, the day before the closure of the sale, I found between two floors, no, not hidden, but there was this storage area. And in it, I found loads of papers about Kevin Barry, which are now in UCD, right? I also found loads of, loads, just voluminous correspondence between my grandparents quite, during the Civil War, right? And that's in UCD is being sorted at the moment. And the other half, these are all letters to my grandmother from my grandfather who was on the run. And the other half, her letters to him are in the military archives because he had them all in when he was captured. Right? Well the point is that the stuff the stuff in my grandparents' house, lots of Kevin Barry stuff. My aunt Catherine was married to Patrick Cavill, lots of Patrick Cavill stuff. Right? And I was always told there was nothing. It was just there and just people couldn't oh, you know, couldn't get around to sorting it or whatever and so that material nearly got lost. Again, my, my, my grandmother's youngest sister, Elgin O'Reilly, who married the O'Reilly's eldest son, yeah. Mac O'Reilly. Her papers are UCD now. I, I got a, a go of them first. And they're terrific. And Elgin, I was going to see her, her husband especially for a long time. And she never said. She has all this stuff going after the 1940s from coming along uh, about raising money, uh, all this kind of stuff. She has tons. It's a very good collection. Sheila Humphreys. The oh. Sheila Humphreys material yeah. in it. And so on. And she just never... Because people, you know, it's memories or whatever. There's, a, there's some bullets in the collection, right? Uh, I, I just, and there's, some, there's a, a thing of 303, a clip of expended 303. You know, there's obviously 303 that have been fired and fired. All sorts of stuff. And, uh, but she just never, you know, people, for whatever reason, they don't, you know, I think very often once the person dies, then obviously you can get material then. But in my family's case, no, people die, but nobody bothered to say as on their deathbed, oh, by the way, if you look under there, you'll find lots of stuff. <laughs> and that's my family who pride themselves, particularly on the blessed saint, Saint Kevin. So, there you are. Thank you very much, Thank Professor. You.